So, sorry that everyone had to sit down, but can you all stand back up again and come over against the wall? Because <laughs> we're, we're going to play a game. <laughs> Had, I'm sick and tired of sitting. Um, okay, sorry, everything's on my phone. I'm not texting. Uh, okay, so in this game, there are two sides of the room. That side of the room is yes. This side of the room is no. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions that are hopefully yes, no questions, and you will sort yourself based on how you think you should answer them. Some of these will not be clear cut. So for example, if I said, I have long hair, I might think, yes, I have long hair. But other people with much longer hair could say they have short hair. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, the first question was, I am an EPOG student. But it's looking like everyone's yes. Some of the alumni said they might come, but none of them are here. So we'll start with, I am option A. Yes, I'm option A. No, I am not option A. <laughs> <laughs> no, for you, for you. Sorry, it, it's all you. No, no, who cares about me? Um, this is a really sneaky way for me to get to know who I'm talking to without actually talking to you. <laughs> is that all the option A over there? <laughs> wow. We had a lot more option A my year. This, this went oh, fast. Um, OK, so I am staying in Paris for writing my thesis next year. Yes, staying in Paris. No, going somewhere else. <laughs> wow. Things changed so fast. We almost all stayed in Paris. Um, OK, now the questions get harder. Um, I consider myself an economist. Yes? No. <laughs> You're allowed to be somewhere in the middle if you've got complex feelings. <laughs> yeah, there can be a middle ground. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Luca is our least economist in the room. <laughs> OK, um, I am a fan of the television series A Game of Thrones. Yes? No. <laughs> this is where we see how many of my jokes will be funny. <laughs> Perfect. None of my jokes will be funny. <laughs> OK, um, I know what pluralist economics is. Yes, I know what pluralist economics is, or I have an idea of what pluralist economics is. Yes, over here. No, that's the next question. <laughs> so everyone has some idea. So the next question would be, I consider myself an expert in pluralist economics. I really know a ton about it. Or yes or no. OK. We've got a lot of middling and a lot of traffic jam. <laughs> Alexander, you're on the wrong side. <laughs> okay, end of this game. Um, everyone can sit down. Thank you for <laughs> playing with me. <laughs> so, as you have heard, I am J. Christopher Proctor, and two Exactly two years ago, exactly, to the, we were trying to look at the days. I think exactly two years ago, we turned in econometrics exams, and then it was all downhill from there. Um, it was yesterday, yes, I know. Yeah, it, it, it's, it gets better from there. Um, so, so, this was us. Oh, it's dark. Well, this was our class in 2016, drinking by the river, which is now all underwater, which I'm assuming is your guys' fault for some reason. Um, and there's me in the middle of it with a bottle of very cheap champagne. And so this, this was me two years ago. Um, and, and this just kind of for context of what I have done after EPOG. Um, when I was in Kingston, I got really involved with a group called Rethinking Economics. 
Uh, Rethinking Economics is a student movement that is trying to reform the way economics is taught, mostly at the undergraduate level, but also increasingly in, in more broadly of how we do economics. Um, and, and so the main things that Rethinking wants is real world economics. So I studied economics as an undergrad, right at, starting in 2010, and every single class you would sit there and it was as if everything was perfect. And you kind of all these perfect little models moving around and we never talked about the financial crash. We never talked about the recession. What's going on? How do we explain it? And so that was, that's really the start for a lot of people is understanding that there's a disconnect between what we're being taught and what's going on in the real world. And the next thing that you sort of realize once you start paying attention is it feels like when you're studying economics, you're learning a lot of different things, all kinds of different books. But then if you look closer, it's actually different editions of literally the same book. And, and almost everyone in the world has Greg Mankiw's Principles of Economics. And that's it. That is what economics is. And, and, and that's, that's disappointing. And, and that's where this idea of pluralist economics really comes in, uh, of trying to have different views and different ideas brought into an economics education. Um, and the last pillar that we really worked on in Rethinking Economics is demystifying economics. And, and this is something that even the heterodox are just as bad as most of the mainstream people when it comes to explaining economics in a way that normal people understand and care about. And so it, we, I, I got involved in this in, I guess, 2015, and it has been an insane two years in terms of Brexit in the UK, Trump in the US, and watching the way the economic dialogue is shaped and how, how it seems like facts have gone out the window, but, but not just like, oh, that's a bad thing, but like, okay, what do we do about that? And one of our big responses has been, we need to talk about economics in an understandable way. So that is sort of rethinking economics in a nutshell. And one of my biggest things that I did with rethink economics was create this book, which it's right here. It's actually a real thing. So we started this in Kingston when I was there with Professor Stockhammer. And his idea was, you're doing all of these lectures, all of these seminars. Half of them are people just introducing you to a school of economic thought. What if you just took all of those, had the professors write them down, and publish it in a book? So we drew up a timeline. We figured we could have the whole thing done in like 12 months. And three years later, we finally <laughs> have Rethinking Economics, an introduction to pluralist economics. And there is a promo code that I sent to all of you for like 20% off. Um, we can talk later, but we, we decided to go with a, a big mainstream publisher because we really wanted to try to access people who didn't already know anything about pluralist economics and try to get this into like more mainstream classes by having it be a traditional textbook. One of the drawbacks is that it's super expensive and we're really unhappy with the publisher about the price. So if you sort of go on in this world, like talk to people and we can have conversations about kind of different ways to do things in the future. Um, and so that was, that was my life up until about six months ago. And then I found an organization called Oikos. So Oikos is a really similar organization to Rethinking Economics, except focus on sustainability issues. So it was started 30 years ago in the beautiful Swiss city of St. Gallen to try to integrate sustainability into economics and business education. And originally, the idea of sustainability was a very environmentally focused uh, it was basically integrating environmentalism into business. But over the years, it's really taken a much broader definition of sustainability to include social sustainability. And so as part of this mission, they wanted to hire someone who did pluralist economics and someone who could really talk about different schools of thought and, and get their member groups thinking about pluralist economics. And so somehow they decided to pay me to come and do this. And so. Right now, uh, I have left my apartment this Wednesday and will be traveling for at least three months, going to lots and lots of different cities, talking to Oikos groups, rethinking groups, groups like this, and, and trying to introduce them to, to pluralist economics. We met with the Oikos Paris group yesterday. Um, if anyone's interested in Oikos, there is a group in Paris. They're mostly behavioral economists, oddly enough, but they were very nice. Um, and, and so yeah, this is, this is what my life has turned into in the last two years since, since EPOG, and it has been great. Um, and now I'm here to talk to EPOG, and, and there's kind of a natural question of why the hell would I introduce you to pluralist economics? If anybody in the world should know about it, it should be this master's program. 
But I thought of a couple reasons, and I already had the workshop, so I might as well run it. Um, and the first was just thinking from my own EPUB cohort, there were very different levels of experience with economics. So I know we had one guy who was, uh, came from a medical background and was trying to understand the pharmaceutical industry and thought, well, I need to get an economics degree. And so he was learning everything about economics. And so things like this for a lot of students would still be quite helpful even this far into, into a degree. Um, for other kids, some of the ones coming from Kingston or Berlin, you've been hearing this for two years. Um, and this might be, you might be sick and tired of this by now. But a lot of you will also be doing PhDs, and you may have to teach students sometime in the near future. And so a hope is that I can show you a different way to teach classes and a different way, uh, different pedagogy. And that's sort of something that I know I was quite frustrated with for my entire education of just being talked at for years and years. Um, and, and now I've got a chance to experiment so we can see what works and what doesn't. And the third is that I, I, it's pretty fun. So, Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start the, the workshop phase. And I'm not actually keeping timing. So if someone, we have two activities, and hopefully it's going to get right about to the right timing. Um, about half an hour ago, I sent a booklet to all of you um, that you were not expected to read because I wanted it to be a surprise. I have a couple black and white copies. But if you have internet, it should be on your, on your computers. Uh, and if not, I can, I can hand out a few of these copies. Yeah? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, I just saw that. So what we're going to do is break up into a couple different groups. I'm going to then assign each group a different school of economic thought, and we're going to do some role-playing games as if you are members of this school of thought. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a problem, and you'll have to solve it as a group of Keynesians or institutionalists or so, such. So I, just, how, I can't tell how many people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Did you? Around 30, so six groups, about six groups. Um, while you're still sitting here, I'm going to explain, I'm going to read the problem because it's going to get loud here. And then you can make your groups and I'll give you schools of thought. Um, so the Olympics are coming to Paris in 2024. It's just six short years and the eyes of the world are going to be in France. Prime Minister David Fletcher <laughs> is in charge of getting the country ready to host the world. He wants everything to be perfect in the economy when the games show up, so he can pr impress all of the other world leaders at the Davos summit. <laughs> He's called together his team of pluralist economists to decide how we can quickly go from an average OK economy to the best, most impressive economy in the world. I want concrete, what well, David wants, concrete proposals about what we should do. This isn't a time to summarize the theory of your school of thought. I want specific ideas that he can pass through his parliament to make this economy great in 2024. Great. <laughs> so I guess uh, we can split up into different corners, and then we'll come around, and you can draw a school of thought. Mm -hmm. It usually takes about five minutes to read the section in the booklet, and then we'll have another about seven minutes to try to plan a speech, and then give a one to two minute speech. It's a pretty big group, so we'll, we'll kind of go with that. So probably group one over there, two, three, four, five, and then six somewhere over here, or wherever you want. What's yours? Close Canadian. Uh, <laughs> What's yours? It's not a problem, it's good. It is the problem. No, it's not a problem, it it's good. It is a problem. Look at the destruction. Okay, what's yours? Austrian. You too? Oh no, okay, you are here. What's your group? Economics? Feminist economics. Ah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your group? Uh, behavioral economics. Why not? What's your group? Marxist. <laughs> and you? What's your group? Complexity. Complexity. Okay. Good work. <laughs> Cool. Are we about ready for presentations? Yeah. You don't have to be sitting right here if you don't want. Um, but the, the one rule is you've got to talk into the microphone so the people at home can listen. Does this group up front want to start? Yes. You look closest to ready. 
just get this to you. And you can like present to everyone. So I don't need to say the school of thought. No, no, definitely say what school of thought you are, because everybody knows. Unless you want, it, if you want it to be a surprise, okay. I won't stop you. Can I start? So uh, we are group six, and uh, we have some uh, uh, public intervention for uh, fostering the economy in order to have a great uh, Olympic Games in 2024. First, we need to see that we are in a crisis, and uh, we are not able to understand the crisis un until we understand the power of money in the economy. <laughs> and money is endogenous. Okay, so first of all, for 2024, uh, our great uh, president Macron will launch the first. No, he will launch. Come on. Oh no, <laughs> he will get he will get reelected. He will get reelected, and he will launch the first European uh, employment of last resort. So uh, any European, uh, any French person who is willing to work will build stadiums for the <laughs> Olympics. First of all, we are going to destroy all the old ones and rebuild all over again. <laughs> However, if we still in power after the Olympics, we are going to destroy everything again and rebuild because we can. <laughs> and we don't have problems of balanced trade because we are going to implement the Bancor and the Keynes plan. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, from our point of view, France needs to be decentralized and that's the first and foremost thing that needs to happen. Um, David, uh, we appreciate that you're the president, but we need local authorities because it's only on the local level that people have information and can act accordingly. And in order to coordinate this wonderful information, we have our great price mechanism that arranges for everything and conveys the information necessary to each economic agent. So, um, therefore, we also don't need all, um, all of these uh, set wages and so on. I guess the market will do. And um, also all the government agencies are a problem, so we would really want to see the market mechanism work also in healthcare and in infrastructure. And well, finally, there should be a monopoly on uh, the issuance of money by the government or, or by such an agency. But we would really like to see competing currencies and would appreciate if France could change, uh, change towards Bitcoin. So for... <laughs> Yeah, so um, I guess like this we will have a great Olympics, uh, everyone in their part uh, working together on this great piece, but bottom up. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, Prime Minister Fletcher. We would like to report to you that the economy is complex. <laughs> <laughs> and in the long run, it's complicated. <laughs> so so what, we, what we suggest to you is that we keep, we keep our promises quite modest. We keep our promises quite humble. We might think that we understand how economy works, but the truth is we don't have any idea whatsoever. <laughs> and we also want to propose to you, however, for us to employ the universal basic income, but that is because we are close at Keynesian actually. <laughs> but we also think that by doing that, we will be able to excite the economy in 2024 and impress everyone else. But expect things to go very wrong in the end because things <laughs> might go very wrong in the end and most of the times they will. So, <laughs> so always implement safeguard every here and there. Always expect that things will go way into the wrong side, and maybe we can survive in the end. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if Steve Keen could hear that. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So, Professor Flaché, we have first a question that we. Oh, prime. 
did I say professor? Prime Minister. <laughs> I'm a great actor. Um, first, the question. What is the price to our fellow delegates? What is the price of your mom's dinner that she makes for you with love and care? <laughs> These are the questions that keep us up at night. And we think the way to really promote the French economy in time for the games is to be a caring economy, to be a loving, compassionate economy where no one is excluded, where we can bring everyone to get together and give a strength to everyone and <laughs> beauty and discipline and purpose. Okay, I'm getting off the track. <laughs> uh, maybe a guaranteed basic income might be a good idea so that everyone that is caring and contributing to our society isn't forgotten about just because there isn't a price on their head um, and they give them more flexibility to do, do those things that are great um, perhaps paternal uh, maternal and paternal leave for those who want to look after children and so on um, these might be things that we want to consider in time for the 2024 20, games <laughs> So, uh, first, um, <laughs> first, I will not call Prime Minister David Flasher, but Leader Maximo David Flasher. <laughs> and since our theory is not just a theory of economic transformation, but of political transformation, what should we do is to uh, call for a general strike and to <laughs> to <laughs> organize the workers <laughs> and, uh, and seize the means of production, transform the capitalist state of France in the socialist in a socialist republic, and uh, and then as regards the Olympic Games, they should be cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> Because the, the, the example of the comrades in Brazil teaches us, <laughs> <laughs> teaches us that uh, Olympics, the, that the rhetoric of the Olympics that bring uh, benefits to society overall is simply false. Olympics just bring uh, profits to few capitalists. So what we should do is to cancel the Olympics and uh, remove all the resources uh, to promote, to, to give all the resources to the workers, to promote uh, uh, equitable uh, growth for that ma that doesn't maximize profit but the benefits of human society. Was there one more group? Yeah. Yes. Prime Minister, I have a bad, I have bad news for you. <laughs> we discovered that humans are not maximizing supercomputers. So that also is good news though, because it means we can manipulate them. <laughs> and therefore, I propose or we propose to set up a council on nudging. And the first action that the council will probably propose is to put little flies in every single man's toilet so that <laughs> men don't pee next to it anymore. <laughs> and also, if we want to really take it seriously and accept that there are um, heuristics, we would suggest to you to move away from the market-based policies that your predecessor has, because markets apparently we are equally surprised. Markets don't work very well. <laughs> yeah. But we don't know anything about that because we're microeconomists. <laughs> so that's not our expertise. So I, I think maybe we should give that to the post Keynesians. <laughs> If everyone wants to stay where we are, oh, actually, do we have a decision? <laughs> Which is probably the best idea. In my view. <laughs> <laughs> so let's cancel already the the Olympic Games and and try to find some other thing to increase uh, effective demands. Perfect. But, 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 in an ecological way, probably. But <laughs> nobody told about ecology. In they this, will this next room. time. 
but for the moment, <laughs> nobody, even the, the, the post-Canadian, I thought the post-Canadian have moved towards something else than yeah. just You really growth. thought that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I expected also a little bit uh, women to, to speak uh, in this room, but... Uh, even the even the feminist group was uh, <laughs> led by men. <laughs> okay, <Really? ca> okay, <laughs> <laughs> and cor courageously, courageously, the only woman who speak uh, decided to defend the market. Right, <laughs> great. So, so I, I have some bad news for everyone. We canceled the Olympics, but unfortunately, the people of France weren't wild about that and Prime Minister Fletcher lost the next election. So, <laughs> but I do have good news. We're all academics now, and we are all at the University of Paris 13. And, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but more good news. So, <laughs> our beautiful university has just received funding to open up a new economics institute. The administration wants to pick one school of economic thought for this new, no, for this new institute to focus on. But there's a catch. The money is coming from an eccentric billionaire artist named Danny Long, who, who wants the institute to somehow combine economics and the arts. So you need to make a presentation to the administration of why we should pick your institute. What we need from you is a name of the institute and an example of the kind of art that your institute will produce. To be clear, I don't want you to tell me about the art. I want you to show me the art. So what we did yesterday, um, our presentation was the Institute for Overly Dramatic Marxist Poetry. And we wrote a very dramatic Marxist poem that, that was moving towards revolution. So I have some pens. If anybody wants to draw pretty things, um, you can act, you can sing, you can dance. Um, and we're going to assign new schools to everybody. So I'll come around again with, ooh, fancy. These are the three that need to get done. So you'll get a new school and have again about five minutes to read and then seven to 10 minutes to come up with some kind of presentation. So what's your school? Ecological. Easy. For artists. <laughs> so, and, and, and what's your school? We are the institutionalists. Okay. Yeah. Easy also to be an artist. The institution is creating an institution. Are you here? Are you in which group are you? So, what, what, what's your group now? Feminist what? economists. Yeah. Feminist. Oh. <laughs> what a pleasure. <laughs> After being occupied, I feel really good. <laughs> so, you have just two minutes to speak then, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And what's your group? Sorry? Cooperative economists. Okay. I want to build an institute one back What's your group? Austrians. <laughs> and I already asked, no, what's your group? Marxism. Oh. <laughs> Will you go from Marxism to post Canadian again or? <laughs> Very close. It, uh, it's almost the same. It can be, yes. <laughs> I lost the election. Fortunately, Donny Long is now billionaire. <laughs> Yes, yes, uh, uh, there. If we didn't, we were going to read our Marxist poem, but we can leave that for another day. But no, you can, of course. We can, we have, we can have two Marxist groups. It's a kind of competition. There's always two Marxist groups, at least. 
Okay, presentation time. <laughs> Looks like everyone's ready to go. <laughs> Do we have a volunteer to go first? <laughs> yeah, it, th this back corner is totally ready. Um, I'm going to ask you to try to use the mic as much as you can. We're performance arts. We have, we have yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, well, at least for announcing what your, your institute's named. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the institution is called the institution. <laughs> <laughs> the institution. Who's next? <laughs> Institutionalist economics, I'm hoping. <laughs> Back corner. <laughs> okay, so our institute, our institute um, has got the best acronym because in EPOG we have the very best acronyms. Um, <laughs> so our institute is called Equum Peepoff, <laughs> which. <laughs> which stands for Equalizing Empowering People's Power Fem Institute. <laughs> and um, in our Fem Institute, um, in the Equal People, we have, um, so the, the institute we would like to build would contain multiple rooms, right? And in the very first room, there would be uh, lots of black and white pictures of people who have fought for the rights of women in the past, right? Lots of suffragette pictures. Then in the second room, um, there would be uh, this would be a room where people would automatically switch gender roles. <laughs> so men would suddenly start to care about the people around them. They would start to cook and take care of children, <laughs> suddenly. Um, and then uh, we would have a room that would be uh, full of pink glitter. Just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we would he have, very importantly, uh, another room with pictures of women who made the work of very important economists possible. So we'd have Adam Smith's mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, we would have Harriet Taylor Mill, uh, the wife of, of Mr. Schumpeter, who's no, but nobody knows her name. Um, but with our institute, people would know their names. Thank you. Middle group? Middle group here? Well, uh, our institute is the Common Creativity Institute. Uh, as we are very good at drawing we paint this <laughs> we wanted to re we wanted to represent people building a city but it was not possible so <laughs> we ended with this and the idea that we wanted to transmit was uh, people cooper uh, cooperatively working together not profit uh, driven um, and uh, well building a common city uh, which is the result of a bottom-up process, uh, and um, where, uh, well, as I was saying, uh, uh, there is no interest or it is not profit-driven, and where uh, all people uh, have their insight and participate in, in their process and in policies and in decisions. It looks like someone over here is very ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, hello everyone, we are the Ayn Rand Institute for <laughs> Free Arts. And this happening, as you can see, represents the dangers of collectivism and socialism. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> this is the type of art we will perform if you find us. <laughs> Thank you very much.
There's a group over here. <laughs> Duh. Too many chairs. Uh, so our uh, institution is uh, honoring our um, honorable Mayaskovsky, and it's the name of the institution is Mayaskovsky, which who was a uh, a great poet, a Soviet poet, <laughs> and so uh, what we are going to do is basically we have uh, in mind two very practical policies. Uh, <laughs> the first one, we are going to. Um, None of the current platforms that we have nowadays, for-profit platforms, they're all going to be destroyed. And these platforms, for example, Spotify, Netflix, uh, Deezer, uh, Amazon, all of them are going to be owned from now on by the artists. So <laughs> <laughs> the artists now own their own art. Okay? And... The second policy, also very practical. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to paint all the buildings of this city red. <laughs> and this is mainly the prototype of what we have in mind. <laughs> we have a final group. Final, do I miss one? So the name of our institute is DISA, is Danny Long Institute of Zero Waste Fashion and Arts. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the C, okay? Just okay. Yes. Where is Hayo? Is that the last group? Yes. I think we can have a 10 minute break and then do presentations from the Are discussants. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, should we read our poetry? <laughs> okay, we'll read one, one poem from the Marxist Institute of Overly Dramatic Poetry. <laughs> and then, oh yeah, then I guess David picks the winner. Um, you have to make, make the sounds again. <laughs> Capitalism. Everyone goes to work, but where does the money go? Capitalism. They take our time, they take our money, they take our freedom. Capitalism. There, there has to be a better way. Say what? Workers coming together, taking the power. Say more. Building a world without discrimination, without injustice. Marxism. Breaking down the class barriers that keep us apart. Marxism! Marxism. Let the revolution begin. <laughs> okay, so welcome back everyone. Uh, me and Ethere, we will uh, put some light on what basically we thought about rethinking economics and how we are going to take the discussion forward. So our topic is basically rethinking economics, introduction to the pluralistic economics. Uh, this is the outline of our presentation. Uh, we will try to uh, define pluralism and iconocracy. Then we'll move towards what basically rethinking economics is and how this forum originates and what are the different paradigms of economics. And then we will do um, criticism uh, about the pluralism. Ethere will discuss that. And then we will move towards the discussion points that we want to put forward to um, Proctor. Uh, basically, pluralism is a, a broad tapestry in economics idea in which uh, it teaches about the prevailing theories, but with that it comes up with the critical ideas to invade into the economic ideas. 
uh, econocracy on the opposite uh, uh, on the other hand is basically in econom uh, when economics basically becomes the purpose of uh, po uh, politics and the economic policy making is basically a technocratic process instead of uh, handed over to academicians and proper thinkers in terms of economics and common people what basically rethinking economics is uh, uh, rethinking economics is an international network formed by different students and uh, academicians and professionals. Um, it is a society that basically integrates people and economists from all over the world and get them together, provide them a form of thinking uh, about economics in a different way, just not the uh, trivial economical ideas, but to put forward a new approach into economics. Uh, it's a globally uh, discussed and described chain, uh, including different students and teachers from all over the world. Um, it was first formed in Sydney. Uh, the idea was basically in Sydney, it was uh, uh, teachers and professors and the students basically wanted to get out of the narrow ideas of economics. Um, <coughs> They put forward this idea of um, rethinking economics. Not the word was not that coined, uh, not coined at that time, but this idea came up. In 1992, there was a pub, uh, a paper was published uh, in American Economic Review, which was signed by different um, Nobel laureates at that time, uh, like Simelson and Solo, who actually um, helped in promoting this idea of broader economics. Later on, in 2000 and 2003. Uh, whole worldwide campaign basically of led by students from Paris, Cambridge and Harvard took place who argued about the education and how narrow the approaches of economics are. And uh, in France it got a, a lot of fame due to uh, media coverage and stuff and it was really uh, a kind of uh, sounded a lot and pronounced a lot in France uh, and later on it moved forward to other parts of the world like Brazil, Germany, UK and other places. Um, pluralistic nature of economics basically basically talks about how students think about economics in a different way and how we have to incorporate the social perspectives from other social sciences into economics, just not thinking about the economic theories of uh, individuality into economics, but we have to come up with some different perspective of economics and including other social sciences. Uh, a lot of people say that this pluralism ideas are not uh, are very applicable and not achievable. But if we see different fields of uh, uh, social sciences like philosophy, politics, they have very integrated uh, studies, including um, uh, studies from all over the fields, uh, and they incorporate different fields into them. So in this way, uh, economics has a huge room for that. Um, it is very, it's a very diversified approach from that of, it wants to give a new lens to basically the mainstream economics. With that, um, uh, it will help the policy makers to make judgment and practices with reasonable uh, practical approaches and will address the issues of complexity in a very meaningful way. Uh, applicability. For the applicability of this approach, we basically need to make some changes into the curriculum, particularly and students are the step forward for it. We need to put a lot of effort in this term. Uh, we have to understand economics as a social reality instead of understanding economics as a mathematical and a modeling reality. With that, we have to include social sciences into economics, making economics a very realistic school of thought in getting out of this um, uh, mo motions of equilibrium and demand and supply curves to a very realistic, approachable policy uh, making approach. With that, we have to uh, apply, just not explain economics in terms of quantitative analyses, but with that we should have a proper room for qualitative analysis with qualitative approaches that can actually help this rethinking school of thought to incorporate not just quantitatively and support their facts, but qualitatively these approaches. There were different paradigms of economics uh, in the paper that was suggested by Proctor, uh, in which e what basically we got each and every paradigm of economics from orthodox, heterodox, new Keynesian to feminist school of thought are actually focusing on a particular subject that is of a real interest. But uh, the idea of pluralism actually takes in account all these subjects and looks into a broader lens into the uh, field of economics. Um, neoclassical basically 
a school of thought focuses on human being as a very radical and rational human being uh, focusing on individualism optimization and equilibrium these are the three basic aspects and prongs that they want to move forward with but actually if we think and we look on to ourselves human being is not basically a radical and rational Uh, human being we have other values we give value not just to money in our decision making process we give values to different social aspects and different psychological aspects when we look into this idea of utility and happiness heterodox if we define the approach of heterodox basically in economics is a community of economist uh, which we they have a various different and alternative way of thinking about the neo classical economics there is a positive approach and a negative approach in it the positive approach is basically according to colander it's um, a term which usually is a um, uh, 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 negative approach is basically when you uh, al- when you give an alternate approach uh, as, uh, oppose the approach of orthodox economics but positive approach is basically you identify the loopholes and you come up with some strands from the social sciences and instead of opposing the orthodox thought you come up with alternating thoughts into the orthodox approaches okay thank you mariam up to stand so in my part i will focus more on uh, some discussion points and criticism of what of rethinking not not of pluralism in economics i will start from an article published some days ago by Samuel Bowles in the, on the financial times that it identifies two variants of pluralism uh, pluralism by ju- juxtaposition that i called uh, selective pluralism even for spelling reasons and um, in uh, according to which different par- approaches are contrasted more or less what we did before and so there there is the poskenish and the marxian etc and then uh, the pluralism by integration that is the one that Samuel Bowles advocates that is the idea that we can marshal together different insights from different school of thought uh, and uh, coming up with a single superior common a common superior paradigm and an example is the core project i will talk about it later so uh, first um, to try trying to criticize the idea of selective pluralism i will try to tell you a story uh, a scenario from a pluralist world where the pluralist revolution has won and uh, all in all universities students take classes of neoclassical economics post-asian economics marx and political economy etc and uh, so basically no one in this room will would be unemployed and everything perfect um, but then they uh, finish undergraduate their graduate studies and they get hired to in central banks big corporations international institutions etc Uh, when asked to solve a problem, the the, the, st- the former student will do exactly what we did before. So, and will probably come up w- come up with a paper saying that's the solution proposed by Lucas Friedman, Tobin, Hayek, Keynes. If he's a risk lover, he will mention Marx probably, and he will say then that's the choice. Pick up one at your pleasure. Uh, the outcome is probably that the guy gets fired. And uh, in this sense, the moral of the history will be that there is, there is always, there are many ways to solve economic problems, but they are always the result of a precise choice uh, that are based on what we we believe is the the most effective policy. And to determine what's the most effective policy, we should maybe look at. Uh, another idea of pluralism that is the eclectic pluralism advocated by uh, Samuel Bowles but in this sense i will say that uh, the idea of eclectic pluralism is always a way to preserve the status quo uh, and i need uh, mm, i there are two examples the first is the reception and the reabsorption of the general theory within the mainstream with x the lm curve um, everything that you already know and also the core project that i mentioned before that is the project uh, directed by Wendy Carlin with Thomas Piketty um, eminent economists that uh, f- founded by Einet uh, that um, well that try to put real world before the theories because well we the theories should come after the real world that translated from new speak to english full sounds like there is no alternative to mainstream and we should follow our research agenda and history of economic thought in this sense completely 
disappears. And the second argument that uh, I, I will base more on a Gramscian perspective, that uh, according to which social science is always the result of a more or less precise uh, political choices, political choice, and uh, intellectual is always organic to a certain uh, group or social class. And uh, for example, I don't see why a pro-labor economist should try to combine his ideas with someone that wants to cut wages and wage protection. Uh, then second, now probably you will laugh at me. Uh, I took this uh, this citation from Skeia is taken by from um, the British Journal of Re for Religion Religious Education. That is, uh, uh, it's the, the the paper is on pluralism and plurality in uh, education in religious education, and that's very impressive how that if you substitute the word religion with economics, you get an article that can be published on real world economic review or something like this. That's maybe just, that's uh, very, exp it really explains the state of the art of economics probably. And this idea uh, underlined a contradiction, a contradiction um, uh, yeah, well, a contradiction of the pluralist narrative that I think it's quite uh, it's quite radical in its uh, implications, since there are uh, he argues that there is a multitude of religions uh, in a certain society, but pluralism uh, is uh, we refer to pluralism both to refer both referring to this multitude of religions and to the educational policy for all. Um, and in this sense, it, distingu it distinguishes between uh, plurality and the attitude toward plurality. Then there are, uh, there is, uh, there are different religions as there are different schools of thought. But uh, one thing is to argue that they, to, to describe them in a descriptive sense, so to promote plurality. And another is the, the idea of pluralism as a normative valuation of the plurality. And he, he also uses the uh, duck uh, um, rabbit uh, illusion to explain this. And now, coming back to economics from this interdisciplinary drift, uh, Riccardo Bellofiore, an Italian economist, wrote something uh, I think quite interesting in, uh, in, the, in, in this difference between pluralism and plurality. Uh, arguing that we should not promote pluralism, but make economic theory the ground, the field for conflicting, uh, conflicting plural theories. And also now, coming back a bit more on the relation between pluralism and uh, heterodoxy, there is this nice debate on a book edited by Fulbrook in 2008 between Tony Lawson and Davis, in which uh, Lawson argues that there is uh, that heterodoxy is inherently pluralistic in its uh, constitutive orientation, and so there, there is an ontological distinction between uh, between heterodox and orthodox. So uh, orthodox is anti-pluralist precisely because it's monistic against the holistic uh, idea that uh, that inspires heterodoxy. And so, my first discussion point will be, why should we promote, uh, since, since the orthodox is inherently uh, anti-pluralist, why should we, should we promote pluralism? That means coping with everyone and not hetero the heterodox research agenda. Then uh, we have also some other discussion points. We want to, for the sake of curiosity, we want to know more, a bit more on which are which were the main challenges and achievements faced by rethinking economics in terms of changing both the curriculum curricula but also the research agenda. And uh, what's the intake of the organization regarding the current state of the art of academic publishing? I, I think uh, to the publish of parish in highly ranked journals and so on. Um, then at second point, uh, I will ask you, don't you think that also more than pluralism we should promote critical thinking that somehow is missing both on the, from in the mainstream and also in, the, in, in heterodox uh, economics sometimes? And, uh, well, and the last case study can, uh, is since the, uh, the pluralist eco heterodox economists keep hiring neoclassical colleagues in their economics department while the opposite never happens, is this pluralism sustainable? So these are our references.
and uh, thank you. Yes? Should I sneak to the front? Okay. I don't know, can I stand? Is there? So I think. I think I'll actually start with the middle question first. Yeah, that, yeah, there was one. Oh, yes, at the end of the yeah, no, staying here. On, on the question, sort of this question of plurality and pluralism and different types of pluralism and really like, really comes down to a question of what is it that we want? Like what is the ideal system that we're working towards? Um, and, and I think uh, an important distinction is pluralism in education versus pluralism more generally. So in rethinking and more generally in the student movement, there's a handful of other groups that are doing similar things. We talk a lot about pluralism in education and particularly in undergraduate education. So what that does is it sort of tries to set aside some of those questions of like, what should a research agenda look like? What should, what should graduate studies, PhD, like should you have to learn everything? And say like, those are kind of complicated, tricky questions, but for an undergraduate degree, that's where it seems more clear cut, that if there are all of these different disagreeing schools of thought, students should be introduced to them. Students should at least know that they exist. And then to the degree to which you actually specialize in any of those, that's when it can be left up to a graduate program. So sort of in my personal ideal vision of what it would look like to study economics, it would be a lot more similar to what political science looks like today, at least in the United States, where you take a lot of different classes, you get kind of a taste of a bunch of different things, and most kids graduate and sort of have an idea of what political science is, and then 5% go and do further studies, and then they go into international relations, they go into constitutional law, or very, they get very specialized and specific in different things. And I think the way I, if I could design the system, it would look a lot like that. Because I, we always have to keep in mind, like, we're here in master's degrees, and a lot of us will go do PhDs and stay in this world. But for the vast majority of people who interact with economics, it's through one class that they take in the first year of their university or in high school. And for another massive group of people, it's an economics degree that they get, but then never really th do any more academics. So from just a social change perspective, that's really where our thinking is, is that the kind of research and the, the graduate stuff, like that's important, but as a student movement where we have the most leverage and where we have the most authority to speak is on these questions of undergraduate education. And I think you're totally right to, to highlight critical thinking as the buzzword that, that we sort of are in love with because it, no one can say we don't want critical thinking. It's very difficult to, to sort of argue against that. And our argument would be that in trying to have a pluralist curriculum forces you to have critical thinking. Just by having these different schools of thought in proximity to each other, it, it is naturally conducive to critical thinking in a way that other, in a way that a, a, mono, a mon, monolithic arrangement isn't. But with sort of a big asterisk that pluralism probably isn't enough. Um, and, and that's where things like methods, teaching methods come in, and real world activities. So something we talk a lot about in other groups, and when I'm talking with more undergraduates, is like, if you could design the activities of your class, what would you do? Like, would you be in lectures and doing tests? Well, probably not. You might want to like go out and talk to people in the economy and, and try to come up with a report of like, talk to 15 people off the street and ask them, how does the economy affect you? Come up with your own economic theories. Try to see like, what would that even be like if you had to like explain some economic phenomenon in a general way? Or, or assign every student in a class a country that they don't know anything about and then make them follow the economic news of that country for a year and report back to the class once a month on what's going on in Nicaragua. And, and these are the kind of things that we start thinking of for an undergraduate education. It's not necessarily pluralist, I guess, but, but it goes very well, hand in hand. So there's the methodological, or the, the, the methods, teaching methods critique, that along with the more academic theory critique. And I guess that's why whenever I, I do the slides of like what is rethinking, I always start with real world, because that's what got us mad. When we were all students, we had no idea about this 
pluralism stuff, but we knew something was wrong, and that's, that's what got started. And then as we got master's degrees and did PhDs, we learned more of this background and learned about these different schools of thought, and that's sort of been the way into that. Um, I think just one other point on that, something that, that comes up a lot is this question of should we be promoting separate schools of thought or trying to work towards a, a bigger progressive alternative, sort of not necessarily a new mainstream, but, but a coherent alternative to neoclassical economics. Personally, I'm kind of agnostic on that question. Um, I feel like both are better than nothing and it's exciting that we're working towards that. Uh, I, I agree. I agree it's an important question and it's sort of, I see both sides in terms of we don't want to create a new mainstream that in 50 years will be corrupted and then we'll have to overthrow that too. But on the other hand, it's very difficult when I say, oh, this is what economics is like. You just have to learn nine different schools of thought. And then in a year, I'm going to come out with a new version with four more schools of thought that you have to learn. And then you've got to learn all these things. And that can be overwhelming and difficult. But, but I think that's why for like next five years, next three years, what our goals are is really making it to where, so if, if I'm setting a goal for like what would I want Rethinking to accomplish, say within the places that we operate, 30% of students at the end of their degrees can name at least four of these schools. And maybe 10% of students know a whole lot about some of these schools of thought. And, and, and then progressing step by step, I, I think we can do quite a bit and towards moving to the point where we could have some of these great dilemmas of, oh no, it's a pluralist world, and like, yeah, there will be problems with that. Um, so I, I think just, I'll talk a little bit about rethinking more practically and what we've done, and then I had a couple questions for you that I was gonna pull up another slideshow. Um, actually, this is perfect. That one of my slides is the answer to that question. Um, so, I don't know if what you can see here. Yeah, oh, so, there. Oh, it's like totally gone? So I, I guess the, um, the structure of rethinking is local groups that are organized on university campuses and then an international structure that helps support those local groups. Um, and so within that, there's kind of two lines of attack. One is local university groups trying to impact their university and change their own curriculums. And we've had very mixed successes, I would say. Um, there's been sort of a, a lot of, uh, the colors are kind of funny there. Um, a lot of activity and, and, and some good success stories. So I, I, there is, it's hard to keep them all straight, but one thing we've been quite good at is getting master's programs, like EPOG, not necessarily started, but supporting that and feeding students into these programs. Um, Kingston in the UK, Greenwich in the UK, Leeds Business School, where you're starting to get centers of, not even necessarily pluralism, but of critical economics, and, and that we've been helpful in that. In terms of undergraduate, there's been a handful of universities that have tried to take on the task of changing but it's been hard and it's been very slow. I would say what you see much more of is universities agreeing to specific demands. So a university saying, we'll teach a history of economic thought class, we'll teach a class on the financial crisis, but we're not going to like totally revamp the curriculum, which we're, that's progress. The rethinking is only about four years old as an organization. So this is still the very early years. Um, it was funny, the, uh, I think on the website, it does say it, like the movement started in Sydney. Um, but it's sort of, you can pick a date whenever you want to because people have been talking about this for years and years and years. Um, and, and so this is something, something quite interesting on the local side. On the international side, there's all kinds of big exciting projects and this is where I feel like we've been really successful. Um, so the book, this was sort of my big thing and what I've been doing. We have the other book, which is The Econocracy, which I sent a chapter of. This is much more talking about the, the struggle for pluralism and, and really the idea of demystifying economics. It was sort of connecting those two issues. And that was written by three students from Manchester. Um, economy which was another organization I worked for, is a, a public education or public news, news website that is trying to present economic and business news in an understandable way. So it was started by a bunch of rethinking students who sort of spun off into their whole own different world to create economy. 
Um, and if you want to find it, it's ECNMY, economy without the O's, dot org. Um, and they're, they're doing all kinds of interesting, interesting stuff, which is not intended for us. It's not written for people in this room, which is something that's really refreshing, is that it, the, the target audience does not have a master's degree in economics, which is kind of rare among a lot of the stuff that we're doing here. Uh, the Minsky's is another really exciting move, or project. Um, some, some a graduate student program at the Levi Institute, I can never say that correctly, in New York, um, the, the Shrine to Hyman Minsky, have started a website blog with an incredible artist who draws the prettiest things. And they, they have all kinds of articles about, about economics. And, and that's sort of been just one graduate program creating this website. Uh, and then Exploring Economics came out of the German network. And, and that really, is very similar to our book um, in terms of going school of thought by school of thought and trying to explain what, what they think and what's going on with them, um, but is open source and online. And so that's, I kind of can't talk more highly about that. They're very, very good. Um, and so I guess I, I just, oh, I had some notes over there, but I no, can't see half of you, if that's OK. Um, so when I, when I knew I was going to get the chance to talk to Epoch, I was quite excited about it because this is an incredibly unique place where you have, you have motivated students who mostly want to change the world. That's sort of why you're here, at least when David was picking everyone, that was like the point. Um, it was something in your application said, like, we think you can go out and really do things, and you're highly educated. You're sort of the, the top level of the, the education system as it currently stands. And so that, that really puts you in a unique place, and us as an EPOG community, where there really isn't anyone else like this. No one else is going to do this for us. So we have friends at Amherst. There's a couple other groups, but it's, it's a really small community. And, and so it, it, I think it's, it's good, particularly now that before half of you leave and go to other places, to start thinking and talking together about what can you do as a group. And what can we as a broader EPOG community do to really make some of the changes that we, we think should happen in the world? And, and so the way I kind of organize my thinking on this is first, what can we do right now? So something like creating a blog, creating this, an online platform, writing your own ideas and publishing them. That's something that like, you could set up in a month and have running. Not necessarily saying that that's what you want to do, but that is right now a very active thing you could try to do to change the world. A whole point number one, again, uh, a very different question is, what are we doing now to be prepared for in 20 to 30 years when we come to power? So I, I always come back to this example of what happened in Greece, where overnight, out of nowhere, the leftists win. And suddenly the question is, OK, you have a country. What are you going to do? And, and I cannot personally speak about what that experience must have been like, but it sure seems overwhelming. Uh, and I think, I think right now we need to be having these conversations about in our careers, where are we going and will we be ready at some point when the political winds change? Because hell, we're getting whipped back and forth every couple of years between radical differences. It's not that out of the picture that a post-Keynesian world could be coming or whatever school of thought we are. It, it's, our time could be on the horizon. And I think that it, it's good for us to think about concrete things we can do now to be prepared for that. So just want to put up a map of the economy that people in the back probably cannot see that we created at Economy um, to try to visualize what does it look like for the economy. And it's just sort of a good thing to have on the wall while we have more of a discussion. But if I don't know how much time we have, but I think, I think there's still discussion time. Um, if everyone's OK with a little more experimenting in, in unconventional teaching methods, I was wondering if everyone can just spend three, four minutes by yourself writing down a couple ideas of concrete things that we could do to achieve one of these two things. And what we'll do is, after everyone's had some time to like really think about this, because I don't want to kind of just throw it on you, then get together in groups of three and sort of discuss together. And in your groups of three, come up with the three or four best ideas and then we'll, slow, we'll get into bigger groups and bigger groups until we run out of time. And hopefully at the end, have a list of some of the things that we're most excited about. And if nothing else, it's, it's a good way to start thinking about what the problems are that we're trying to solve and what tools we have in this room to try to solve them. 
So if everyone's OK, you can take about four or five minutes and try to write down three, four ideas. Um, so if we want to come together and have each group present some of the ideas that they have, um, and we have a microphone here, and then we can kind of have a go to a big conversation either about those ideas or about other questions, whatever. Okay. So the idea is the mic will be given to the group, and like you should share the ideas that you want to say. With that, if you have some questions, you could put forward. So Proctor would glad to be answered. Okay, who wants to start first? <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, first, we have to realize that there is a problem, okay, which is very, it's international and it's very deep enough. So to make the change is not easy. This is the, fir the first thing to know. Okay, now we will move to the second step if we want really to reform the system. To reform the system, you have to have many aspects and it's not enough to speak about them now. But first, you have to realize something, that the mainstream thinking is very strong. It's really, really strong. And it's really brainwashed. Like, I, I mean it. So if you take, for example, I will take, uh, and I discussed with him this idea, and he agreed to mention it, is that we have one of the e-book, for example. I'm not against his ideas, but I'm just presenting something that is re real. He studied in the mainstream way. Okay? He came to e-book. He studied heterodox economics. But still, he is really believing in the system of the mainstream. He is really believing in it. You give him the other broads of economics, but he is still believing in the system. Why? We have to know that there is a problem. It's not only that he is not critical, I'm, I'm against his idea, but to have to say that you need more depth in terms of courses. I'm not speaking about it, I'm speaking in general. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you need more depth uh, in terms of the school of thought, and this is the problems of the, what you are saying is that if you study many sco schools of thought, are you able enough to understand them fully, go deep into them, and be critical to them? It's, this is very critical. Second is the idea of the job market. If you go to the job market, it's always what the mainstream school is really teaching them. So if you want to go to the mainstream, you have to have their tools. You have to believe in the system. And even if you don't believe in the system, with the time you will be within the system. So how you will really create the job market for heterodox economists? Okay, there are solutions of creating internship, for example, and but there is not enough. How you will create this really job market for the heterodox economist? At the end is. Education is not enough to address critical thinking. There is a political power in these issues, which is really, really, really hard to fix. I am heterodox. I believe really in the system, but you have really to know that it's difficult to make the change. Thank you. Uh, second group, who wants to speak? This group in the front here was really eager. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, who would speak on this? Can we share the mic? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll start. Um, one uh, thing we can change right now um, was that, in principle, uh, Epoch is an awesome program, and I think many of us uh, would defend it uh, to, a, to a far point. Um, however, we think uh, maybe that in Epoch itself uh, we should have more space to exchange ideas, to uh, increase the number of sessions uh, such as this one, thank you very much, um, let people brainstorm more, get together more, increase groups cohesion. We have seen this in the like first three weeks, but uh, I just realized I was sitting here and you said, yeah, just uh, brainstorm a bit. and. Uh, I handed in uh, the econometrics report yesterday and I had so much work to do the last month that uh, there's no, absolutely no space left in my brain to, to be creative about this. So I think um, if we take Epoch's mission seriously, then we need to create more space for, for this um, in order to build and maintain strong ties between us. Um, 
Another thing is that, um, very important point I think is that we have to sort of overcome the pessimism or a slight minority complex several uh, heterodox economists have because um, because of exactly the points uh, Jean and mentioned uh, just mentioned. Um, so the question is, what sort of story do we want to tell um, to other people? And um, yeah, along with this goes that we have to sell ourselves and that means that um, within the group uh, critical assessment and um, I don't know, sort of a harsh critique can be can be very justified but maybe um, looking outwards it makes sense to always defend the program. Um, yeah, and then... Um, do you want to make a point? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. And I think connected with that is also that um, we should maybe rather the whole um, heterodox thought, we should rather see it and especially sell it more as a toolkit that actually gives us uh, more tools to analyze um, um, real world problems and lay, maybe not say, okay, the uh, mainstream tool is like bullshit and we have like a better tool but saying like okay but actually we have more tools and actually that gives us maybe a view on the problem that others do not have which could also giving us if we frame it the right way um, actually also bargain power when we then looking for jobs and applying for jobs in the job market. Uh, sometimes it's like it seems like people who are in heterodox like they sometimes totally like kind of go so much in extreme that uh, this mainstream is bullshit or like we don't like these things. I mean, at least we have to have to at least know that okay what they are saying or what they think, and then if we go for this critical analysis or things, I think that is the best way to do that. If we know that what is your counterpart is telling and what is your counterpart is doing then it's really, really difficult like, to uh, proceed with those things. And also it's not like that sometimes maybe also you need to like, combine maybe the both according to the situation, the way, or maybe, and in a way we are not something inventing new, it's like you are adapting the previous one in a new way, that I feel whenever sometimes I read any theory, it's like, okay, there was something before and we are making, we, like we are adding something on it that I feel like most of the times and that is I think feel like the, the most important things like it's not just exist like just go with the one is existing on you add some things and go for it and also like in um, if you see that economics like there are so many part it's like they ignore sometimes the minority part that if you see kind of any kind of analysis or something like you'll see that the the analysis for the minority things is always missing. For example, the transgender things or the gay things or those things is always missing from the analysis. Even even the heterodox economics also, they are not considering those kind of things. So how you see the difference then? So maybe someone else can also um, um, Thank you very much. I think the, uh, the problem of mainstream is that uh, more phenomena emerged, and this and the problem is these uh, phenomena they w they w they are not uh, they cannot be easily measured and harmonized into the pre-existing uh, mathematical models, and that's why the models are not working. The uh, sociological and the and, and the psychological uh, aspect of 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 any economy. So, uh, and I think we are moving into a age of multipolarism. Well, we have, we have we'll be having many school of thought, even in the uh, rethinking economics. So we have many people with many, many school of thought, and it should be so convincing. I think what we need to do is first to look for solutions, so as to measure variables, to, to create a unique school of thought, a, a, a proper global convergence on how this, uh, we should identify these problems and try to measure them, to solve them. Uh, just to add on what the guys were saying, I, I felt that we could connect what Janan was saying of the mainstream is very strong, wake up people, <laughs> uh, and what at first I was saying of you have to know your counterpart, 
and the presentation of Ettore showing if you are hired by a president and you show, okay, so a Marxist would say this, a feminist would say this, you pick, is not going to work. So what, what I see the mainstream does very well is to tell a story. Carmen also mentioned that. So in, we should be able in our story to, to kind of make the school of, of the different schools of thought work together. So David said, oh, so the post Keynesians could have brought some ecological thinking to the table. So maybe in your dynamic, if we would, we would have like a third activity, I would suggest, so how do we work together? Because we are now a team and we have to come up with one common agenda. So to force ourselves to see the linkages between the schools. Um, I think uh, and coming back to the, the program itself, maybe more spaces like this would help us build that story together. Thank you. This group over here. <laughs> oh. I saw a good discussion over here, didn't somebody? <laughs> they didn't agree on <laughs> I mean, we didn't, um, some of the points were mentioned already, so. Maybe one of the main points that came to, to our mind was that uh, th this problem of this coordination, uh, that mainstream has uh, something very coordinated, uh, well structured to tell, and maybe uh, there are very small groups all around, uh, like very local groups that have these ideas, but it's um, it has never been uh, like. Um, conciliated and, and the communication uh, is very difficult uh, so maybe like uh, tackling this problem of communication and integration of the ideas maybe like through media and in enhancing the communication tools of of these local groups David did you want to share your um, I think there's also a generational interesting aspect to it um, so if I look at the case of my university where we created the rethinking group um, in Montreal, in the 70s there was a pluralist department, but it no liberal rise, change in departments, it's progressive but the impact is very felt today in the term of if you have a new generation of people going out of the university, um, they don't face prepared institutions uh, that can take them on and uh, from which they can build even though they have their critique and the potential and, their, and all of that. Um, because these institutions were destroyed and uh, because the media place also changed quite a lot. Uh, not being used to having those voices, for example. When I was in Montreal for Christmas, I was talking with a like, think tank um, and they were like, if you work for us, you have to be prepared to actually face the media and even there's a strong bias of the person who will interview you. Um, so you will not only have to debate in front of a guy who is super, super uh, neoclassical in his way of thinking and pro-market uh, and kind of fed by business, but the change was also felt in the people who will interview you, which are supposed to be good on biased medias. Um, so all of these like institutions that are not necessarily ready and what I found really interesting is the case of Brazil where pluralist departments are very interesting and, and but then the next step is not there where the labor market is not there so there's a kind of uh, even though we if we come prepared come cr with critical mind we have to think the institutions that are going to like welcome this new generation um, and this is not really make a change now, but it's really like one of the big issue where it's going to come from so many different directions, but also it's going to take a long time to create those institutions. Um, but the case of, of Greece, uh, as you mentioned, is interesting because it's like, yes, we have to be prepared to those questions for when the, like, the emergence of these institutions will be synchronized enough to be, to, to be able to create a change and a movement. So. I think there is always to keep in mind not only like that our energy must be like spent in finding those new solution for the, when that moment will will be like everything will built into something, but um, like even though it's not necessarily apparent, this generation is still there, and and there's still something to think about about that. There's a hand in the very back. Um, thank you again for today, and uh, I tried to raise my voice a bit so you hear me. Uh, 
Um, I just uh, have a notice regarding the, um, um, the composition of the cohorts of EPOC in general, and perhaps we are uh, the ratio of uh, uh, people from developing and developed wor uh, countries is a bit more than 50 percent, I think. And as a former EPOC student, what do you think uh, um, <laughs> those who went back to their countries in developing uh, countries now are doing? Or are you communicating somehow? Are you trying to develop opportunities as well, not just in... Because m apparently most of the, um, most of the movements, f like rethinking economics or, uh, or other ones, are based either in UK uh, Europe, US, <laughs> do you have any connections with those who went back? Because if, if so, we don't want to be, um, we don't want more than half of the cohort go back to their countries and then get absorbed totally by their uh, jobs, whatever it is, wh whatever the orientation, heterodox, uh, orthodox, whatever, but then lose all the networking that we have talked about in Turin, perhaps <laughs> all the externalities that could be um, could be uh, achieved, but but actually n not due to the uh, the loss of the networking among uh, the alumni. So thank you. I don't know if I should respond to that directly, just while we're on this question. Yeah, um, yeah mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think kind of person by person through my cohort and the cohort before me. And I, w I feel like the trend was f a lot of people from developing countries actually stayed in Europe or went to the US, um, mostly for PhDs um, or other job opportunities. Um, and I'm sort of like trying to think of examples of people who did go home to their countries and I don't know if I can Think of, I'm sure there are, but I'm not coming up with names. And so I, th I think that's a different problem. That, that's kind of, that is also something we should talk about. Um, and, and you're totally right in terms of the, the, centri the Eurocentricism, really, at this point, of the student movements, um, because they're not actually in the United States very much at all. Um, it sort of is UK and Europe with local groups in other areas. That's something, so in Oikos, for example, there's five or six groups in India, and they're, they're kind of, quite proud of having that presence, but how integrated can we actually be is always a big question when it costs 1,000 euro to fly people back and forth. And, and, and so that's sort of, it's conversations we have, I think it's conversations EPOG should have, but, but I think this is where EPOG does have uh, an advantage because just financially you can bring someone to Europe once and be here for two years. And it's not like with student organizations where we're mostly dealing with conferences and events. And, and it's the geo I think the geography is much harder. Um, but in terms of like going back and building institutions, not just in Europe, but all over the world. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not the one with answers to that, those questions. But, but I'm glad we're asking them. There was. Uh, I, I thought Leila was going to say, but I think one of the most important things is also get involved into politics because it's not just keeps. Uh, in the academia, which is really important also, but just studying the theory and not doing anything uh, where actually the change, the change come. Uh, and for that also, uh, like EPOG, uh, economics age, uh, economic policies in the age of uh, globalization. And uh, actually you had few, just few classes that actually discussed policy the Danny Lang tried a little bit but not really open for the discussions and maybe if what we could do uh, change now maybe now it's, uh, it's too late for the semester and for people that are going but it's like more actually group group discussions about uh, can be even uh, small groups uh, depends on the topic that people are interested uh, but some place that we can we could go deep uh, deeper uh, in the in topics instead of uh, having lots of lots of work but really broad and in a way that we, you actually don't uh, understand completely uh, yeah
Thank you for your presentation and workshop. Um, my thoughts on the matter are such that I think we need a multi-pronged approach. I think any sort of um, too simplified approach to advancing the cause of pluralism um, will almost inevitably fail. We need that sort of mass appeal by approaching the real world topics and saying, hey, this map in economics doesn't address reality as we know it. That's a, um, something I think Schumacher was talking about. Um, but also on top of that, we need within academia the ability to be able to have those debates with those mainstream or neoclassical economists. Because if you just criticize their assumptions, and this is something I know from first-hand experience, is they go, yeah, 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 of course, these assumptions are unrealistic, but you missed the point. And as such, you can't just at attack them on their assumptions. They will say, well, the point of a model is to have a benchmark and so on and so on. So what we need, I believe, is history of economic thought, I think is great. It n is the most natural way to encourage um, the sort of seeds of doubts and curiosity towards pluralism in undergrads. And also it's something that those in the mainstream actually are willing to listen to because it's kind of connected to, um, to their way of thinking about things. But also, and this is something I, I believe to be really, really important, philosophy of economics. What, how do we know an economic theory is true? Some scientists take philosophy of science and you know, there's big debates to be had. When someone within economics says, okay, you know, a mainstream person says, these assumptions aren't realistic, but we're going to um, do it for the basis of this, we need to be able to have that debate where we, we're able, using history of economic thought, to say examples from the past where certain instrumentalist defenses of a theory don't work, or, well, they think they work, but they don't. Um, and we'll be able to say, well, you know, what we actually think of as true. What is truth in economics? What is knowledge? What is a good theory? How do we distinguish good theories from bad theories? We really need to have these really crucial core uh, discussions, I think, within economics about what makes something good. Because it's not just anything goes. If we think pluralism is anything goes, we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Because then we just open the door to, to all sorts of um, nonsense. So we need to have that crucial debate about what is good. And I think philosophy of economics is a beautiful way of doing that. Thank you. Did you want to, in the front? <laughs> the young gentleman in the front. Yeah, in the front. Um, I was a little bit surprised by the answer, which were really interesting, so I took some notes and probably for the future. But I understood your questions, uh, not how to change economics, but how to change, uh, I mean, how as economists we could change the world, which is not exactly the same. And so I, I wrote on my paper because you asked me, so I, I met with myself and uh, <laughs> I, I said, okay, maybe we should uh, volunteer much more in NGOs, uh, in politics, uh, in campaigning, because when, uh, when Jay Christopher was here in Epoch, it was the time of the campaign uh, uh, for the... Um, for Bernie Sanders and uh, Hillary Clinton, so he, w he had his computer with Bernie Sanders written on it, and it was okay, really advocating for him. And so, I mean, a kind of uh, engagement uh, which was, uh, I think, very important. Um, and participate to the debate is really also, in, in my view, very important. I mean, as economists, you are able to write statements to send and send it to the newspapers. You are able to participate to think tanks. You are okay. So this is my my point of view about uh, what can be at, at least now to change something. Then to be prepared because there was another question: how how can we be prepared to the to to be. If you, if, you, if you had to be in power, what, what would you do? And it was the co a question raised also by Glenn Moore from the f first cohort, and she will give a joint seminar on, uh, on the 6th. I will be on vacation, so I won't be with you, but it will be really interesting, and she's r really wonderful. Uh, and in my view, I mean, as EPOC student, as Jay Christopher said, it's, it's a very, very specific ecosystem. I mean, we, we could select really excellent people from all around the world, I mean, in, I think it does not exist anywhere else. Probably the course are not good enough for you, I don't know, but, uh, but you are really uh, the students we wanted to have. And you are really able to, to, uh, to probably create your own think tank, gather people from other uh, universities, your previous uh, comrades, etc., and, and try to build something and 
intervene, prepare, uh, uh, debate, because also you, 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 are, you, are probably, you do not agree each other, but at least have this debate, having this debate is, is really important. And that was like one, one idea like this, because we had so many ideas today. Uh, to be, like a shadow cabinet uh, in your country or at the level of a continent where you just criticize the policy of a government or uh, a group of governments on, on this on the issue when a, a big law is has been issued you can you can i mean say it's not the right law because we should do in another manner i mean there are probably many ways to uh step by step create another uh program another perspective for uh, for changing the world and so probably there is an articulation between uh, uh short run medium run and long run and it has to be thought by epoch students with many other people but it has to be it has a ref it has to be a reflection started now and going on in the in the next years all together yeah if i can just two points um so the nobody can see me way up here um a, a, a like a dichotomy that we came up with at some point in rethinking that's been really helpful is the difference between starting the debate and winning the debate and it seems like in academia, particularly in heterodox academia, we spend all of our time trying to win the debate, trying to come up with the best arguments, the best criticisms, without realizing that we haven't actually started the debate and nobody's paying attention to our criticisms. And so to start the debate, we need institutions. And that's kind of, at least that is my opinion, is that we need things like think tanks, we need organizations, we need ways to speak bigger than just ourselves. Um, and, and one, one great thing that we all have or are about to have in this room is a master's degree with the word economics on it. And because we live in a silly world, that will give us a particular power that maybe we don't deserve. Um, but <laughs> we should at least recognize that whichever side of the wall you are on, you can say you're an economist and nobody can say you're not. And, and that that gives us something that we can take forward um, in whatever it is that we want to do together. Um, just one other sort of real practical point from a, a, a big mistake I think my cohort made was when we wrote our theses, we did it completely separately. We didn't communicate with each other and we never talked together about how we can use the six months of our lives to do something other than write a paper that we send to our advisor and then we're done with. Um, and so if I could do it all over again, I, I wish we could have had like once every two week meetings or something or try to organize our theses topically, think of ways to like broadcast or get our ideas that we're all working on together and, and like broadcast them out to some other type of audience. Um, I know you're all about to start working on that and a bunch of you are gonna get on planes to go to other places. Um, but I, if I could go back in time, I wish I, we had really gotten our act together um, because it's kind of a lonely process in a certain, certain sense. You're just doing your own thing um, and even just having some, for your own good, to have someone to talk to about what it is you're doing. Um, that would be my thing. I don't actually know if this ends at 4.30 or 5. Um, so I, I'm, I, I'm more than happy to hang out. Um, if, if it's getting late and people want to leave, that's fine. But it sounds like there's a good conversation if we want to keep going. We also always go drink by the, pub, or drink by the river after. That is a time-honored EPOG 2016 tradition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, guys, I want to say something. Yeah. Because everyone goes into topic uh, uh, of ebook program itself. Uh, for me at the beginning, I didn't mean ebook, but I want to say something since it's mentioned. Uh, I really believe that ebook is rev revolutionary, and I think it's opportunity for everyone. And I really believe in the system of ebook. There are shortcomings in each program, which is not only ebook. There is no perfect system. But the good thing about it, they are really listening to the students, and they are working on the things that they are, you are saying. So ebook is revolutionary, and you have to take the opportunity of it. Sorry if it's dramatic, but I really mean it. <laughs> and one of the points that were mentioned by other students, some points you are mentioning, we have them on other options. So maybe you don't have it in your option, but it's there on the other option, the vertical aspect, the way to evaluate the theory, we have it in C option. Even the discussion about the thesis of the topic, we have it in C option. I remember me, Vinny, and Declara, which university we were having this discussion, we were criticizing each other, we were putting pressure on each other, but at the end it works, it, it really works. So I think it's there in some options, and that's it, thank you.
so i guess that's all for the day maybe um yeah thank you so much proctor and thank you so much for coming it was really interactive thank you so much all of you for being here and see you again in the next session and the next joint seminar before that for the econometrics exam maybe <laughs> so be, be prepared for your defense goodbye have a good day